Steve Gwyn Uishla Agus Fáilte. Hello and welcome. It's Misha Amy the Crafty Kailuk and today I'm going to be talking about Aran Knitwear. Now the Aran Islands are three islands that are located off the west coast of Ireland or the mainland and they are home to some of Ireland's most well-known legends, ancient forts or dunes and they also are very known for their knitwear. Today, some of the myths and legends I'm going to be talking about relate to Aran knitwear, specifically the origin of the Aran sweater or jumper. If you're new to my channel, I am Amy the Crafty Kylock and I make content about Irish history, folklore, food and magic. In talking about the myth or legend of the origin of the Aran sweater, I'm being a little bit controversial. Although there are historians that have been able to pinpoint the introduction of this myth into folklore, it is still something that is very much believed to this day and is promoted as part of heritage to this day by certain companies. One of the main sources that I am using on this is Alice Starmore's book, Aran Knitting, which is a fantastic dive not only into the history of Aran knitwear and the origin of the Aran sweater or Aran Gansey, but also contains lots of patterns for knitting. Starmore says that the tale of the distant origins of Aran knitting fits so seamlessly into the general Aran mythscape that to deny it seems to deny the existence of the islands themselves. The main myth that I'm going to be talking about today is kind of twofold in its origin. So firstly, I'm going to be talking about the myth that the iron sweater is over 1100 years old, dating back to ancient Celtic times. The second part of the myth that I will be discussing and the origin of it is that the iron jumper patterns were handed down from family to family to help identify fishermen that may be lost at sea. So the iron jumper actually was not seen or popularized until the 20th century in Ireland. Despite many studies and disputes from historians, there's a lot of contradictory information still out there regarding the origin of the iron sweater. We call them jumpers in Ireland, so I'm gonna be calling them sweaters, jumpers, and gansies throughout this video. To try and cut through the contradictory evidence that is surrounding this Aran jumper myth, Alice Starmore actually traveled to the Aran Islands to speak to some natives to try and get the real story. What she came up with was two contradictory stories. In speaking to one young woman in a conversation in English, she states that that young woman affirmed the ancient Celtic origin of the Aran style sweater and style knit and also the ancient Celtic origins going back millennia to our Celtic ancestors as well as the meanings and symbolism behind the styles of Aran sweater. However, an older woman jumped in apparently hot on the heels of this first person and put Starmore straight. In a conversation as Gwelga, this older woman described how her mother and her grandmother before her had been knitting sweaters for generations. The style of sweater wasn't particular to Aran or the Aran Islands. However, it was influenced by Scottish fishermen that would travel to and from the Aran Islands to fish and also would interact with locals and help with fishing techniques and fishing in general. These Scottish fishermen had slightly fancier jumpers with cable knit and different patterns and so locals started to use those cable knit patterns in their own knitting. In fact, this particular woman told Starmore that not only was there an influence from Scotland in the types of cable knit, but also that on the islands, they actually called them Scottish Gansies. Gansey is the Irish word or typical modern Irish word for jumper or sweater. After this style started being used more and more on the island, it became sort of associated with the Aran Islands. Starmore goes on to explain the origin of the myth of this ancient Celtic style of jumper or knitting 
to have originated from Heinz Edgar Q, who in 1936 found an Aran style jumper in a shop in Dublin. While he didn't discover the Aran jumper, he certainly popularized it. He also popularized many other myths regarding the history of knitting and knitwear. And according to Starmore, Q was prone to fanciful notions about the origins of certain types of craft. One of my favorite quotes in this entire book by Starmore is the following. Regarding the fanciful theories that Q had, Starmore says that they tended to reach back into the mists of time, reads deep symbolism into knitting pattern and is completely unsullied by any contact with hard evidence. It was with Aaron knitting, however, that Q's imagination really excelled itself. I just want to take a second to chef's kiss that critique. It is so wonderfully biting. I'm definitely going to use that in future writing. So thank you, Alice. But Q wrote a book called The Sacred History of Knitting, which was published in 1971. Specifically in this book, Q uses the Book of Kells to prove the origin of Aran knitwear. In a misinterpretation of Celtic knotwork, which is infinite in its design in that it has no beginning or end, Q tries to argue that the figures in the borders in the illuminated manuscript of the Book of Kells is an example of ancient Celtic knitwear and sweaters, trying to argue that some of the figures and beasts on particular folios are wearing sweaters and that's what the design is. Starmore points out that with this logic, then a particular beast on a different folio would be wearing a knitted catsuit. While you can argue that the style of knotwork in the Book of Kells is replicated on metalwork and stonework throughout Celtic art, and particularly in art found in Ireland, it's really incorrect to apply the same logic to Aran knitwear. Because Aran knitwear, while it is geometric in pattern and does look similar to the Celtic knotwork, it is not infinite and it is made up of plaits and braids. Starmore goes further in the biting critique of Q and points out that access to the Book of Kells is strictly controlled. It is found in the old library in Trinity College, Dublin, and has been there since the 17th century. And also that department staff in Trinity College, Dublin, know absolutely nothing about these assertions from Q that these figures in the book are wearing ancient Celtic knitwear. Stop trying to make ancient Celtic knitwear happen. It's not going to happen. However ridiculous this might seem today to us with our knowledge that we have today, Q insisted and asserted this assumption, providing a myth and a story about the origin of Aran knitwear dating back to 790 CE or aka the end of the 8th century, start of the 9th century. He tied this myth and legend to the stories of saints on the Aran Islands, which would have been starting around the same time with the saint hagiographies that are available. Not only did he do this and made up this completely false narrative and history of the Aran sweater, he also called islanders wise and proud illiterate, describing how they would hand down these patterns for protection and blessings for those that would be wearing the jumpers. However lovely the idea and however true the idea that when you're making or crafting something, you can put intention into it, there was no actual tradition of this happening. And also in asserting that this was the origin of the Aran jumper and of Aran knitwear in general, Q didn't seem to put too much stock in the fact that for the 1100 years that followed this, there was no evidence remaining. So if this was such a strong tradition, why do we not have evidence until the 20th century of Aran knitwear? Q didn't ask questions like this. He just 
continued with the myth, continued spreading this fanciful notion that he had and introduced ideas like the diamond pattern meaning wealth, the zigzag pattern meaning or symbolizing the zigzag of the coastline and the cliffs and a whole load of other symbolism that did not actually exist. Q's manufactured theory persists today. But why is that? Why do these myths and why does information persist even when it's incorrect, even when the origins have been disproven with fact and even when we have no historical basis for them? According to Starmore, and I would agree, humans do value myth over fact. And because the Iron Islands have so much legend and folklore and magic attached to them, it's easy to attribute this extra myth to the islands. Like the quote I read at the start, to disprove the myth would nearly be disproving that the islands exist at all. That's how tied in and knitted in to the myth of the Aran Jumper it is. And not only is it the connection of myth with Aran, it's also the connection of myth with story. And it makes a great story. And Irish people, we love a good story. Everyone loves a good story, but particularly here, we're fond of a good story. And not only are we fond of a good story, but advertisers are also fond of a good story and they make for excellent marketing techniques. Stories sell and stories sell things, they also sell ideas. And one of the first people to profit from this story was Q himself. So Q profited from his tall tale by bringing production to, ironically, Scotland, because there wasn't enough knitters in Arran. Production of Arran jumpers has continued and is one very big export from Ireland. Now, I'm not saying that every Arran jumper is a fake Arran jumper, but what I am saying is this myth that is produced about the symbolism and the ancient Celtic origins of it are incorrect. Now I'm going to talk about the second part of this myth, which is that they were used to identify fishermen lost at sea. This particular part of the myth did not come from Q. However, it has been embedded into the fabric of the overall myth that started with Q. The particular myth was that there were individual family patterns that were handed down from generation to generation, which did start with Q. And then the reasoning for these patterns and for the specific clan patterns to identify fishermen actually came from a play. Specifically one scene in a J.M. Singe play, Riders to the Sea. In the play, in one scene, character Nora identifies a fisherman who has been lost to sea by the four dropped stitches in one of the socks that she has knit him. There's no mention of identifying the fisherman by his jumper, just by this one sock. And I would agree with Starmore's assertion that just like those four dropped stitches, the myths about the iron jumper should be dropped unceremoniously. I just really like how Starmore bites into this, but Starmore isn't the only one that's critiqued this. In fact, many historians have. I'm going to put Alistair Moore's book title and info down below and I'm also going to include Vaughan Corrigan. I'll give the details down in the description if you'd like to learn more about this and read about it yourself. But Q, as I was reading about this, really puts in these fanciful notions that are really typical of antiquarians at the time and really reminded me of the type of stuff that Robert Graves puts into Celtic paganism and Celtic spirituality. If you don't know about Robert Graves and what he has done to Ohm specifically in the Irish tradition, let me know in the comments and I will be only delighted to do a video on Robert Graves and all of that nonsense. I really don't mean to crap all over Aaron Jumpers either. They are a really lovely design. It is a really important export from Ireland. I just want to bring awareness to the fact that it's not this ancient Celtic origins thing that keeps being pushed by marketing, particularly outside of Ireland, though there are companies in Ireland that are still pushing that narrative. This is an example of some Irish knitwear, which I actually got on the Aran Islands on Inish Man when we were there on our honeymoon. And if you haven't seen that video, the vlog that I did on the Aran Islands during the honeymoon, you can check that out 
up here. But that is just a little bit of the myth and legend of Irish iron jumpers. If you want to learn more about Irish heritage crafts, I'm actually doing a class over at the Irish Pagan School. I put the link for enrollment in the description below where I'll be going through a bunch of different hand crafts that are traditional to Ireland and also going through some of the origins and influences from other countries on those crafts and industries. This video is actually based on research I did for the class but I couldn't quite fit a 20 minute rant into the class. And I also thought that it would be a fun YouTube video to do because it is something that is so widely believed that it seems to be within its own class of folklore or fake lore. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Let me know what you thought in the comments. Were you today years old when you found out that iron sweaters don't have a Celtic ancient origin or did you know this already? Are there any other things that you would like me to debunk or look into in Irish culture or heritage that you've heard of? If you like this content, do think about subscribing if you haven't already. I will be presenting more research on Irish handcraft traditions because I've done a whole bunch of research for this class that I'm doing. Also being the crafty Kyle look, I might venture out and try some of these handcrafts as well if I get the time. So make sure you subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Akashine for me, that is it from me. I will see you in the next video. Slongafol.